Come on, double cherry. Damn it. Oh, <laughs> hello and good evening. Sorry, you caught me doing a little late night scratching. You see, times are a little tough here at Midnight Rental. Rent's due, we had a pipe burst and it ruined a bunch of our tapes and I can't even afford dry cleaning. That's why I'm still wearing the same clothes that I had on when we went on tour. I don't know what we're gonna do to get enough money in time, but I do know that where there's bad luck, there's Friday the 13th. And being that today is Friday the 13th, I thought, why not do a little deep dive into the franchise that changed the innocent setting of summer camp forever? I'm sure that you've all seen the 1980 movie, Friday the 13th, that was so effective, it spawned nine sequels, a television series, a popular series crossover, a reboot, and has almost nearly as much merchandise as it does a high body count. Solidifying a spot on the horror Mount Rushmore, Friday the 13th made Jason Voorhees a household name, and he doesn't even show up as the killer until the second movie. I am a massive fan of the franchise. So, for tonight, consider me your personal camp counselor to help lead you through the film series that we know and love as Friday the 13th. For those of you who haven't yet seen the original, I'll quickly go over the plot. The film opens with an idyllic setting at Camp Crystal Lake in 1958 with some camp counselors sitting in a cabin around the fireplace singing. Two of the counselors sneak upstairs for some body grabbing. He said we were special. I meant everything. He's lying, don't listen to him. And wouldn't you know it, that point of view camera with the creepy music followed them and, well, all good things must come to an end because that was in fact a killer. We weren't doing anything, we were just messing up. <laughs> From there, we're thrust forward in time to Camp Crystal Lake present day, which back then was 1980, where the counselors are arriving at the lake to prepare the camp in time for incoming campers. In a scene that further sets the tone for the film, we meet Annie, a plucky hitchhiking counselor, played by Robbie Can Morgan, who's headed to the camp to serve as cook. How far is it to Camp Crystal Lake? We also meet Bad fan far, favorite huh? Crazy Ralph. You go to Camp Blood, ain't you? God damn it, Ralph, get out of here. Go played on, by get. legendary Keep character actor alone. Walt Gorney. From the jump, she is immediately warned about heading to the camp from everybody in okay. town. Camp Blood, they're opening that place again? Keep including Crazy alone. Ralph. You'll never come back again. Oh, shut up, Ralph. It's got a death curse. After hitching a ride with one truck driver... Quit. Quit now. Quit? Why would I want to quit? Camp Crystal Lake has changed. Annie gets another ride from someone whose identity is hidden from us. Hi. I'm going to Camp Crystal Lake. Feel-good anticipation that wholesome Annie was exuding fades quickly as she begins to realize the driver is not taking her where she needs to go. Hey, wasn't that the road up for Camp Crystal Lake back there? Now, the way this entire scene was shot was what unsettled me the first time I saw it. Her happiness changing to desperation in her face as she tries to make sense of what's happening to her is still just as creepily effective when viewed today. The mere three minutes that Annie's in the movie are short, but completely unforgettable. From there, we get to meet the rest of the group who made it to Camp Crystal Lake alive. Most notably, Alice, played by Adrian King. Uh, this is Alice. What about Brenda? Hi, you told me Steve Cavendish's no, no, I'd rather she... Camp director Steve Christie, played by Peter Brower. Marcy, played by Janine Taylor. Ned, played by Mark Nelson. Oh, shit. Bill, played by Harry Crosby. Son of Bing. Now you have jazz, 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 jazz. Brenda, played by Lori Bertram. Are you crazy? And of course, everybody's favorite future star in a speedo, Kevin Bacon. It's gonna storm. You can 
and tear down that valley like a son of a gun. The plot is mostly straightforward. The group is getting the camp ready for incoming campers, while also having some fun and touching each other's body parts. There's some good-natured laughs in the lake, sex in the cabins, and strip monopoly in front of a fire. However, a storm rolls in, and so does the same non-verbal point of view of the ominous killer, who then sets their sights on the counselors. One by one, they're picked off as the night goes on. As the evening and killing progress, Alice gets startled by a woman. Well, I, I'm Mrs. Voorhees, an old friend of the Christie's. Played by Betsy Palmer. Pamela Voorhees is initially kind-faced and calm in the midst of all of the chaos and fear Alice is going through while she's been discovering her friends have been murdered. Any semblance of safety is quickly gone. Did you know that a young boy drowned the year before those two others were killed? The counselors weren't paying any attention. They were making love while that young boy drowned. His name was Jason. Jason should have been watched every minute. Jason was my son, and today is his birthday. Where's Mr. Christie? Alice quickly figures out that Pamela Voorhees has been the one murdering everyone. Kill her, Mommy. Kill her. They wind up in a massive showdown that climaxes when Alice completely beheads her. Stunned, Alice climbs into a canoe and falls asleep. End scene. Or almost. What comes next cemented the movie's place in the Horror Movie Hall of Fame. It's morning. Alice is serenely waking up in the canoe. The music is calm, peaceful. Then without warning, we see a grotesque boy covered in river goo burst out of the water and grab Alice from the canoe to drag her in. It's an enormous jump scare nearly on the level with the end scene of Carrie. Next, Alice awakens in the hospital bed screaming and asks, are they all dead? Yes, ma'am. The boy. Is he dead too? Ma'am, we didn't find any boy. Then he's still there. And this completely changes what we know about the story now. Was it all a dream? Was Mrs. Voorhees' boy Jason alive the entire time? Where is he now? And how did he make it to over ten other movies? Well, we have a couple people to thank for that. Victor Miller, Steve Miner, Harry Manfredini, Tom Savini, and Sean Cunningham. Sean Cunningham had wrapped the hit, Last House on the Left with Wes Craven, and was looking for his next big movie. He'd previously worked with both Steve Miner and Victor Miller and roped them in on the project. His idea? Impressed with the blockbuster success of Halloween, he decided he would imitate its premise, make a lot of horned up young people get stuck together in the path of a ruthless killer. Sean had long had Friday the 13th in his head as a title, and without even having a script or release day, he took out a full page ad in Variety that said Friday the 13th, the most terrifying film ever made in giant graphic block letters. He said he did that to both generate interest and get potential investment capital, and also to see if anyone would sue him in case there was already a film with that name. No one did, so they moved forward. Victor Miller would serve as writer, and after remembering how much camp scared him as a kid, I was a wuss, he said, they had their setting that would forever change how people viewed summer camp. The film's budget was just a little over $500,000, and filming took place over six weeks in Blairstown, New Jersey, at Camp Nobi Bosco, a functional Boy Scout camp to this very day. You can even tour it, which I have done twice and I highly recommend. It is so much fun. It looks just like you're in the movie. <sighs> Anyway, the movie is very minimal, much like Halloween, but it definitely has more blood. Also like Halloween, the film's tension is only elevated by the amazing theatrical score by Harry Manfredini. Composer Harry Manfredini. So much of the delight of Friday the 13th and the, the experience of it came from the sound effects and the music. Somehow or other, the music had to evoke and point out the fact that the killer was there. It wasn't just the camera shooting, it was the POV of the killer. Harry's, um, Delightful signature piece. The if you go to the end of the film, you'll see a very close up of Betsy Palmer's uh, Mrs. Voorhees' mouth, where she's saying to herself, Killer Mommy. Killer Mommy. Killer. I just went and I took the consonant sound of the K, K I from Killer, and M A from Mommy. I went up to a microphone and just went. And we ran it through something called an echoplex, which was a 
gizmo back in the late 70s, early 80s, and it ended up coming. <laughs> and that, of course, became the instant sound that I needed to bring the killer into the first reel and, and throughout the picture. And I'm sure that without Harry's music, without the sound effects, we never would have had the success that, that finally happened. Cunningham also roped in special effects artist Tom Savini, along with his assistant, Tazo Stravakis, a friend from college who had recently teamed up with Tom on Dawn of the Dead. The startlingly realistic effects in the film were achieved due to not only Savini's talents, but also because of his real-life experience as a combat photographer in Vietnam. Savini has said, if it doesn't look like what he saw in Vietnam, then it doesn't look right. Both Savini and Tasso wound up being in the film quite a bit, even if you don't realize it while you're watching. You didn't see Laurie Bartram die, the girl in the archery range. She was just thrown for the window. It was actually me in her nightgown and wig going through the window. Tasso Stavrakis was my assistant on that movie. We actually made a cast of Betsy Palmer's head, made a rubber gummy of it, and we decorated it inside so when it severed, you would see anatomically correct gore in there. It was uh, Tommy Savini's assistant. It was attached to him in some way, and Tommy Savini is the one that cut it off. What I did was I tested it with toothpicks. So the toothpicks were just kind of holding it in place, knowing that when I whacked it with that machete, it would go through the toothpicks. And I wanted to whack it so the head would spin, which, which luckily it did in the first time. But if you watch the movie, when Betsy Palmer is decapitated, her hands come up into frame and, and kind of like a grabbing air. They're Tasso's hands with hairy knuckles. It's not that small, you know, it's these big meat puffs that he's got as hands. As for casting Friday the 13th, Cunningham was straight to the point. He said, we weren't looking for the greatest actors in the world. I wanted kids who were somewhat likable, responsible camp counselors. Basically, they had to be reasonably good looking, they had to be able to read dialogue fairly well, and they had to work for cheap. When casting for the lead role, they auditioned hundreds of girls and finally cast Adrian King as Alice, who would become one of horror's most memorable final girls. Cunningham appreciated her humble likability and girl next door appeal. Whatever that something is, she's just got it, he has said. Equally as important, they still needed the perfectly cast killer to play Pamela Voorhees. Estelle Parsons, probably best known for her portrayal as Roseanne's mother on the hit series Roseanne, was initially offered the role but turned it down because it was too violent. Enter Betsy Palmer, a classically trained theater actor who had a long history on stage. In her own words, my agent sent the script over to me and I read it and I just thought it was a total piece of shit. But I did the film anyway because I needed to buy a new car. It would be the role she'd be best remembered for. The actor who played young Jason was Ari Lehman, who has dubbed himself First Jason, which is also the same name of his Friday the 13th themed band. Casting a group of young, fresh-faced actors proved to be successful as the camaraderie they had off camera absolutely comes through on screen. They also cast a young Kevin Bacon, who at that point had only had a few seconds in Animal House and a bit part in the Burt Reynolds film Starting Over. Kevin Bacon's character has one of the film's most gruesome ways to die, and all the thanks goes to the genius of Tom Savini for executing such a realistic effect. The real Kevin Bacon was underneath the bed with his head sticking out with a fake neck and chest piece attached to him. The neck was reused from the Martin film set that Savini had previously worked on. Now they only had one take to get the shot right, and when the camera started rolling, the blood tube became detached from the pump that was supposed to squirt out of the wound. But um, I had done uh, George Romero's Martin, and in Martin, the guy had to get a stick in his neck. In Kevin Bacon's case, we put that wife beater on the fake body. He's like on his knees under the bed with his head here, and here's the fake body. Me and my buddy Tasso under there, and uh, you know I'm pushing the arrow through when Tasso was pumping the blood. But an accident occurred. The tube separated from Tasso's pump. So he grabbed it and blew in it. And that's what made the blood shoot out, which didn't gurgle was a happy accident it made the effect, you know, bloodier and grislier. The success of this effect made Savini what Cunningham would call the real star of this film. Once the film opened, it grossed $39 million. It went on to earn an additional $17 million in video store rentals. They had a certifiable hit on their hands. The critics, however, had other feelings. Strangely enough, the very same critics who had applauded Halloween just a little over two years prior attacked Friday the 13th, calling it misogynistic, mean, and mindless. Gene Siskel, in particular, seemed to take the film extremely personally and went on a campaign demanding that no one go see it 
and even gave away the ending in his review as a dissuasion. He also encouraged people to voice their disgust by writing to both the head of Paramount and Betsy Palmer. He even published their addresses. Pretty aggressive for a guy who reviews other people's movies. But no matter how the critics felt about Friday the 13th, one thing could be agreed upon. The general public loved it. And it was making money. And where there's money to be made, you know what that means. Sequel time. Rounding out the end of Friday the 13th, we had a total of 10 victims. The first Friday the 13th was released in June of 1980, and Friday the 13th Part 2 had a lightning fast release day of May 1st, 1981, less than a year later. Cunningham was busy on other projects, but Cunningham's protege, Steve Miner, was brought into the spotlight to direct. Cunningham fully supported the decision and continued to serve as his mentor if Miner had any questions along the way. Miner wanted Savini back, but he had schedule conflicts as he was in production working on The Burning. Carl Fullerton stepped in. Savini's assistant Tazo was offered the role of playing adult Jason, but turned it down. A major life regret, he has since said, and the role went to Steve Dash. Ron Kurtz, who had served as revision writer for Victor Miller on the first Friday the 13th, was hired as head script writer. They tried to negotiate a deal to bring back Adrian King, but they felt the agent was asking for too much money. So they brought her back, but for a very short amount of time as she is killed within the first opening minutes after discovering Pamela Voorhees' head in her fridge. The second film's premise is back at the camp with more camp, more counselors, and more killing. I told the others they didn't believe me. Doomed. It's really just more of the same, but part two does have a few firsts for the franchise. Skinny dipping, an elaborate death scene of a counselor in a wheelchair, and the first time we meet who would lead the series going forward, adult Jason Voorhees. Though he's got a bag over his head in this one. Part two's final girl is Ginny, played by Amy Steele, a tough as shit female who has you rooting for her until the final scene when she uses her wits to outsmart Jason. The movie does capture quite a bit of the same feeling as the first movie does, partly due to the same number of crew members from the original film being on board. Part 2 rounded out at the box office with $21 million, half the amount of the first. And once again, the critics had a field day with it. Me personally, I like Part 2. It does feel like a close continuation of the first film. They really are just a package deal. Director Steve Miner was still proud of his directorial debut, pointing out that the film did quite well for being released less than a year after the first film. Miner would go on to direct the third Friday the 13th film, Halloween H2O, a film I will forever find entertaining, and Soul Man. Rounding out the body count of part two, we land once again at the even number of 10 victims. 1982 would bring us part three, which was a unique entry in the franchise due to the 3D resurgence that was happening in the movie biz, particularly with horror movies. Steve Miner was back in the director's chair, there are a lot of things I love about Part 3, and from the jump, it's the opening title screen that is not only enhanced when you view it in true 3D, but also combined with the total funky town disco score that Michael Zager, a well-known name in the disco world, provided. Just listen to that funk! Another thing I love about Part 3 is the casting. There's something about each of them that all works so well together. From the opening scene with the shop owners arguing like the bunkers, they're all just likable. Yes, even you, Shelly. Horror genres, Charlie Brown. Make a wish. Um, can I buy you two guys a beer or something? Even the biker gang of bullies are fun to watch. Our final girl of the film is Chris, played by Dana Kimmel. If you watch this movie at home without the benefit of 3D, you will not have a difficult time spotting the very obvious intended 3D effects. But it really is best viewed on the big screen with the glasses. There's even a wonderful homage to Savini right before they emulate his famous kill from the first film. Jason is, of course, back in the stab saddle, but he's changed his look. It's okay, Jason. I went through a few phases myself in high school. Punk, goth, hell, I was even a raver for a brief time, but don't tell anyone. This is notable because it would be the first film where he gets the accessory he would forever be known for. The hockey mask. It's the one that stuck. The ending features an unmasked moment with Jason that is still creepy as hell no matter how many times I've seen it. The film grossed $36.6 million and beat out E.T. in its opening weekend as the number one film. Just think about that. Rounding out part three, we land at a body count of 13 victims. 1984 gave us part four, which holds a special place in my heart. This film was to be the final Friday, the movie that would officially kill Jason off for good. 
This was the film that brought Savini back into the effects chair. He created Jason, so it was only fitting that he be the one to see him out. This time, however, we're not at camp. We're at the Jarvis residence, deep in the woods with Tommy Jarvis, played by the prince of 80s child actors, Corey fucking Feldman. Tommy Jarvis's character loves making masks, and the one in his room are all Savini's own creations. A group of vacationing teens move into the house next door to party. All of these characters are an absolute trip, with Crispin Glover coming in at the top. Our final girl of the film is Trish, played by Kimberly Beck, who has an earnest like ability which is only matched by Tommy Jarvis. I love so many things about this entry. The pacing, the way it's shot, it's even got twins! It's fun and it's corny in the best ways possible, but it's also well done and is effectively creepy in more than one scene. Tommy Jarvis's showdown with Jason combined with Savini's incredible effects in the final scene are not to be missed. It brought in close to $33 million at the box office, which no doubt made some studio executives scratch their head and beg the question, wait, why are we killing him off again? The final chapter rounds out with a body count of 13. Which of course leads us to part five, a new beginning. 1985 saw the resurgence of Jason in full force with part five. The movie brings back Tommy Jarvis, but not Corey Feldman, save for a quick intro scene, who is older now and transferring into a halfway house that is chock full of some real characters. Dick Warlock, who played Michael Myers in Halloween 2, was the stunt coordinator and got to work with longtime friend Tom Morga, who portrayed Jason. Part 5 has always been a hotly debated entry in the franchise due to its plot, but one thing you can't argue is that Part 5 brings us two of the most unforgettable scenes in the franchise. They move aside the final girl role for Tommy to become a final boy for you to root for, along with Reggie. The reason Part 5 always causes a lot of debate is because, and if you don't want this ruined because you haven't seen it, plug your ears now, but Jason isn't the killer in this one. It has one of those M. Night Shyamalan twist endings, and boy did that piss a lot of people off. The film still brought in 21 million, the lowest grossing thus far, but with the highest body count of 22. This brings us to 1986 and Part 6, Jason Lives, written and directed by Tom McLaughlin. Part 6 is absolutely one of my favorites. To me, it's a perfect entry in the series. This time around, production knew that they needed some major changes to win the audience back. We've got final boy Tommy Jarvis back in the seat, played by the forever hunky Tom Matthews that you know from Return of the Living Dead. We're back at camp, and most important of all, we've got Jason Voorhees back, for real this time. Inadvertently resurrected by Tommy and a friend who just had to dig him up to make sure that he was still dead. From the 007-inspired opening titles, the film is a non-stop entertaining and completely tongue-in-cheek ride. Its self-awareness is what makes the movie for me, because it's poking fun at the series while having a blast doing so. I was just kidding, Elizabeth. Darren, we better turn around. Why? Because I've seen enough horror movies to know any weirdo wearing a mask is never friendly. <laughs> It's a tight script with perfectly placed jokes, a great cast. I absolutely love Jennifer Cook as Megan, who plays this film's final girl. CJ Matthews makes a perfect Jason who seems to have gained near superhuman power since being resurrected. There isn't a single moment of lag time in part six, and as if it couldn't get any better, it's got Alice Cooper! Jason Lives pulled in 19.4 million at the box office and left us with 18 victims total. Part 7, The New Blood, released in 1988, and it came out while the Friday the 13th franchise was in direct competition with the Nightmare on Elm Street series. This was also when the first conceptual rumblings of creating a Freddy vs. Jason would start to take place. New Blood is what many have called Carrie vs. Jason due to final girl Tina's telekinetic powers. Directed by John Buckler, who also directed Troll, Tina is played by Lara Park Lincoln, and the plot revolves around Tina accidentally releasing Jason from his lake grave using her telekinetic powers. Tina has to not only fend off Jason, but also her evil doctor who wants to manipulate her powers to his benefit. Not my top ranking in the series, but it's got one of the most memorable Jason kills in the franchise's history, and it introduces us to the gift that keeps on giving. Kane Hodder, the incredibly gifted actor and stuntman who would go on to portray Jason in four Friday films, making him the most Jason. The New Blood raked in 19.1 million at the theaters with a final body count of 19. 1989 brought us part eight, Jason Takes Manhattan, which takes us to, well, you guessed it, Manhattan, but only for a few minutes. The title is more than a bit misleading as we spend a majority of the movie on a boat. 
An excited graduating class of high school seniors is headed to New York City by way of boat to celebrate their newly crowned adulthood. It was completely out of the budget to film in New York City, so 99% of the filming took place in Vancouver, including the street scenes. The Times Square scene at the end was the only part of the film shot physically in the Big Apple. There are a couple memorable scenes, but audiences once again felt cheated as the trailer, poster, and even the title all more than suggested that the movie would be censured in Manhattan, though that just wasn't the case, save for the last 15-ish minutes of the film. At time of its release, it was the lowest grossing film of the franchise, coming in with $14.3 million in ticket sales. Jason took Manhattan with a total of 19 kills. Four long years would pass before Jason would greet us with Jason Goes to Hell in 1993, an ambitious but flawed leap into the popular premise at the time of body jumping. That is to say, his evil spirit can inhabit whoever is close by to do his killing for him with the only way to bring himself back to bodily form is to find and inhabit a family member who in turn would also have the ability to kill him with this special magic knife. Okay, This has been referred to as the Evil Dead entry into the series, but it's a real shot in the dark movie plot wise and low on the list of rewatchability for me. This would be the first film distributed by New Line after Paramount let go of the series, and also the first to plant a huge visual wink to the possibility of Freddy vs. Jason actually happening. Jason Goes to Hell pulled in 15.9 million, and the final body count for Part 9 stands at 23. Well, if the time between Jason Takes Manhattan and Jason Goes to Hell seem long, enter the period between Jason X's release, which hit theaters in 2001. The film blasts off and takes Jason not only to space, but far into the future as well. Now, if you've watched our second episode, you know that I absolutely love Jason X and will argue this point until I die. To me, it's a perfect sci-fi film, and director Jim Isaac did an incredible job, as did the rest of the crew. Unfortunately, the goons at Warner Brothers took a chunk out of that episode, so the full synopsis is missing, but I do plan to remaster it at some point, it's just not going to be today. Lexa Doig plays Rowan, one of my favorite final girls ever, Kane Hodder's back, the effects are spectacular, and David Cronenberg is the cherry on this weird Sunday. There aren't enough good things I can say about this movie because it is a movie that knows exactly what it is and it embraces itself and that's why I love it. It grossed 12.6 million in box office sales with a kill count of 24. It also served as a calculated placeholder to keep Jason in the public eye for the long-awaited Freddy vs. Jason, which hit theaters in 2003. Directed by Ronnie Yu, this was a film nearly 15 years in the making in an extremely ambitious effort to bring two competing franchises together. Finally, the two horror icons would go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Freddy has been stripped of his power and needed Jason to start killing teens in Springwood, which would make the residents fearful of Freddy's return and ultimately restore his strength. However, Freddy gets real steamed when Jason starts killing off everyone, including Freddy's intended victims, so he declares war. It's an entertaining movie and a love letter to fans of both franchises. I lined up to see it opening weekend, but it definitely has a standalone feel. Freddy vs. Jason would leave a lot of series regulars absent, most notably Heather Langenkamp and Kane Hodder. It brings the characters together, but leaves them in this kind of unique world that feels separate somehow from both franchises. The film did astronomically well at the box office with 116 million in ticket sales and 23 victims. Mark Watson couldn't afford law school. Don't you think you're overreacting? No. So he got himself a scholarship. Congratulations, Mr. Watson. Thank you, sir. Now he's a Harvard man. Right on. A ladies' man. You know, there's something really strange about you, and I don't know what it is. A changed man. I'd like you to meet my good friend, uh, Kareem Abdul Ali. A soul man. Do you really hate the Beach Boys now? Soul Man, rated PG-13. Starts Friday, October 24th. There's no need to fear the number 13 any longer because Paramount is slashing prices on 13 scary motion picture hits. At only $19.95 each, no one will be able to resist the sharp savings on some of their worst fears. Okay, you big hunk of a man, come and get me. Everyone's just dying for Jason. And now his latest stab at terror has been slashed to just $19.95. Friday the 13th, Part 7, The New Blood. Plus, customers can scream again and again with the entire Friday the 13th Never Say Die collection.
and the terror continues with six more shock-filled hits. The house is burning. Christopher Walken can see the future and must stop it dead in Stephen King's The Dead Zone. And Pet Cemetery's Master of Horror strikes again with the cry of a werewolf. Stephen King's Silver Bullet. There's life out there, and they are conducting some wild experiments. Watch out for Dr. Alien. It attacks without mercy and preys on the mind. There's no escape from brain damage. The Ripper's still out there. The world's most notorious killer is on the loose again. Jack's back. Serial killer David Keith is on a rampage, but don't shoot until you see the white of the eye. 13 will be every video store's luckiest number with these 13 Halloween horror hits, specially reduced to just $19.95 each. Well, I hope that you found all of that both informative and stimulating. Still doesn't solve any of my money problems, though. These lottery tickets never pay off. Guess I'm gonna have to resort to what everyone's been asking for. Only tapes. Hey, Lenora, that box of bootleg Girl Scout cookies you were gonna sell just arrived. <gasps> Problem solved! Well, better luck next time. Happy Friday the 13th, everyone. Good night. I hope that you had a wonderful time here at Midnight Rental tonight. Maybe you learned a little, laughed a lot, and even walked away with some newfound appreciation for even just one Friday the 13th movie. But for this next part, I'm gonna put my glasses on so that you know I'm serious and smart. We here at Midnight Rental really love putting the show on. I really love putting the show on. I do all of the writing, the editing, and the sourcing. And we have a small but truly talented, dedicated team who donate their time and talents to make this show possible. We really could use any extra support that any of you watching have. If you have a trust fund burning a hole in your pocket, head over to patreon.com slash midnight rental to get exclusive access to some behind the scenes content. And more importantly, your donations, support will be going to help keeping the lights on here at Midnight Rental. Our camera guy, Brian, you would like to get paid at some point, right? That'd be great. Yeah, see, Brian could benefit from this. This has become my full-time job, and I truly love doing it, but I've got a mortgage. I, <laughs> I want to keep doing the show for as long as possible because I'm truly taken aback by how many people enjoy it and how much I've grown to enjoy it, and I love it. But we could always use any support that anyone would want to give. And another way that you can support the show that actually won't cost you a dime is following us on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, or even just sharing the show with a like-minded friend who you think would enjoy it. Won't cost you a penny. But no matter what, keep watching the show. We'll keep putting out, blah, we'll keep putting it out for as long as possible. And see, if I had an editor, you wouldn't even know that I flubbed that line. So. Thank you so much for joining us, and have a good night. Sit, Ubu, sit. Good dog.